Good morning, everybody, and a happy Saturday morning to you. Once again, lots of news. And let me remind you that tomorrow is video two, days three and four of our trip to London. You don't want to miss it. So let's jump in and get there, shall we? Let's go. We're going to start off with King Charles. He held audiences at Buckingham Palace. The first one was the ambassador of Austria and his wife, Joanna Warbetz. And the second was the ambassador of Brazil and his wife, that's Tanya and Antonio Patriota. Still sticking with, with King Charles, we're going to talk about the fact that he held a reception at the Lambeth Palace Library, and it was to mark Interfaith Week. The king was there with Justin Welby, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, and about 30 faith leaders and community representatives. They were all there. Now, this is very interesting. He went and viewed religious artifacts there. There is a English translation of the Quran from 1734 and a Talmud that's uh, 500 years old. Unbelievable. For those of you who don't know, Lambeth Palace Library is a historic library of the Archbishops of Canterbury and part of the archives of the Church of England, and it was founded in 1610. I found that very interesting. I think everybody is aware that King Charles has worked for years in promoting tolerance and understanding between different faiths and communities. And we know that the king is a friend to all religions. He always has been. Now, of course, he signed the obligatory book, uh, and it looked like it went well. Now, sticking with King Charles, after that, he hosted an Overseas Territories Ministerial Council reception, also at Buckingham Palace. So for those of you who are unaware, this council exists because it promotes security and good governance, sustainable economic and social development, uh, because some of these areas are having some hardships. And so you get together with these groups and you talk and you exchange ideas and, you know, and this is how you network and these are how things, um, you know, get together. This is how you help each other. So this joint overseas territory council, I guess, it brings together political leaders from other overseas territories with ministers from the UK. And they review and implement strategies that help promote security and good governance of the territories. And again, uh, sustainable economic and social development. So if you happen to live in one of these overseas territories, this would be a very important get together for you. You know what I'm saying? It looks like it went well. I'm sure a lot of good headway was made. And of course the king, that look on his face, y'all. I mean, this man is just enjoying himself, which is, listen, if you have to go to a lot of these meetings, meeting after meeting after meeting, I'm sure after a while they get tedious, but he really seems to be very interested in everything he's doing. I personally happen to think that's important. All right, moving on. We're going to move on to Sophie now. Uh, there's a new care home at St. Giles View in Winchester this past Tuesday the 14th. And Sophie attended the official opening of it because she is the patron of that charity. And uh, doesn't she look lovely? Now there's three different households. You have Littleton, Sparschult, and Chilcom. So she went with residents of the Chilcom household for tea in the St. Giles Cafe. They have a, a nice cafe. Then she went to the Sparschult dining room and she helped decorate a cake. Interesting uh, decorating there, but way to go, Sophie. Then of course she unveiled a plaque and she, she heard how people in the immediate area are coming to um, be involved in activities in the care homes community area. I love that. So people that are there are not cut off from the outside world. I think that's really important when you get older. And a big thank you to Remulade Sauce for everything that Sophie was wearing. Let's move on now, but still sticking with Sophie. Also on the 14th, on the same day, she's patron of the Rochester Cathedral Trust, and she went to a dinner in the nave of the cathedral. Unfortunately, this is the only picture we have. 
But that didn't stop Remulade Sauce from coming up with all the information on what she was wearing. Love it. All right, moving on. Let's move on to Sophie's fabulous husband, Prince Edward the Duke. He was in an educational forum at the Government House Auckland in New Zealand. Remember, he's in New Zealand. And this brought together people from the community, the corporate world, and schools. And they are all working together for the Duke of Edinburgh Award. All right, moving on. We're going to move on to Camilla now, who had the world's oldest writing competition, the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition, and um, she announced the winners. Now, apparently during this um, event, uh, one of the women told a story about how Queen Elizabeth met the former Prime Minister uh, Thatcher, and um, it was a st whatever the story was, it must have been funny because apparently Queen Camilla was absolutely hilariously laughing. So when she finally got up to the stage uh, and she praised the winners of the competition, she announced the winners. By the way, this took place at Buckingham Palace. The participants this year were between ages 11 and 17. She, they had, um, you know, people put in things from India, Malaysia, and they wrote on the subject of a youth-powered commonwealth. And they did read out some pieces from the winners' um, essays. I think that was very nice. The winners were aged 17. 12, 15, and a runner-up aged 11 from India. I think that's really, really cool. It's being reported that the number of people who entered this year is greater than ever. And that's something when you remember that this is a 140-year-old contest. So this contest was founded actually during the reign of Queen Victoria. And for those of you who are history buffs and who know anything about Queen Victoria, she was an avid reader. She loved literature. She wrote diaries, which of course her daughter edited, but okay, we'll, we'll skip past that. All right, let's move on now to Harry and Meghan. A blind item came out that said that one of the things that was released by Omid Scobie for his book is almost word for word what Meghan told a friend in September. Now, people are commenting, maybe Omid is starting to panic. The reaction to his book is not what it should be because everybody knows, as this person said, where Omid's bread is buttered. And he put out a statement on Twitter that says, you know, this is not Harry and Meghan's book. I'm not Meghan's pal. And the Sussexes have nothing to do with it. Uh-huh, right. This guy is flat out just stupid at this point. You put stuff in your book that there's absolutely no way you could have had access to unless it came through Harry and Meghan. And let's not forget that Omid Scobie has been caught perjuring in court before about Harry and Meghan. I have nothing to do with them. I've never socialized with them. I don't have Harry's number, he said, but he did not say or not say if he had Megan's number. The man put a note in the back of his note of his book, a publisher's note. And what does it say? What does it say, guys? He said, I've spoken with former palace staff. That would be James Holt, who currently works for Harry and Meghan. Trusted friends. Okay, people that they could have given information to. Even family members. That would be Doria. Let's not forget that Omid has been caught lying in court. Well, first of all, he swore up and down that Harry and Meghan had nothing to do with finding freedom. And even, even though, as you can see in his author's note, he said he spoke with the couple themselves. But in court, he said that he never socialized with Harry and Meghan. And here's Meghan and there's Omid Scobie over, her, over to the left. So that was a lie as well. Let's not forget that Jason Knopf was the go-between between, between Harry and Meghan and Omid. And we all remember this email where he said we have to be able to say we didn't have anything to do with it when it all came out in court that they did have something to do with it and that Meghan had perjured herself under oath and so had Omid. And let us not forget the judge in that one court case who said that four hours after Megan's attorneys filed in court, he tweeted about it. And there's no way he couldn't have known about it unless Megan gave him the information. Busted. How about when William gave 
uh, Harry incorrect information about how the Queen was going to make it back to the UK, and Harry and Meghan fed it to Omid, who then went on national TV and said the, the you know the the Queen was coming back by train when the truth was she was flying. <laughs> I mean they 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 knew then that Harry and Meghan were still leaking. So with that, I completely agree with according to Taz. If anything was even remotely thawing between Charles and Harry, um, it's over. Because this new book is coming out with more private conversations. And the fact that it's being released right after the 75th birthday of King Charles, that's calculated. Absolutely. Now, we've all heard this. Did he call him? Did he not call him? You know, I'll tell you what. We don't know if that phone call took place. I highly doubt it. But if that phone call took place, Oma just blew it right out of the water. And I don't believe after everything that Harry wrote about the royal family in spare that the king would just, you know, say, oh, yeah, welcome back to the family, son. Now, we know that the information about the call came from the Sussex camp because they even put that in the articles. But Lady C is saying they had to broadcast it because their brand is dead. They can't make any deals. And it's for that reason that articles like this are coming out. Omid wrote that Harry is ready to move past, but William, William won't talk to him. Like the family is just supposed to forget that they were called racist and all the horrible things he said about William and his parenting and Catherine and, and you know Camilla. We can move past it because Harry is that deluded. I'm telling you. Well, I guess the point I'm making about these phone calls is that they were supposed to be private. The BBC knew about it. The Daily Telegraph knew about what was in the conversation to, to Harry and between Harry and Charles. The point is Harry is still trying to exploit his family. He can't keep his mouth shut. And the fact that he's still leaking information the family doesn't trust him. Why would everybody need to know that he called his dad? Why would anybody need to know that? And the fact that private conversations were published so quickly, this is a warning to the family. I mean, think about it, you guys. Buckingham Palace won't even confirm if there was a phone call, but yet the BBC knew that he was going to be calling. And then the Daily Telegraph, which we know always is favorable to Harry and Meghan, had details of the phone conversation. You know, you know that old saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So let's hope that this stops because supposedly they're going to speak again next week. Right. I mean, I'm sure the king and the rest of the family must realize what's going on. Let me tell you, if the royal family is stupid enough to allow Harry and Meghan back into the fold after everything they've done, then they get what they deserve. I don't think William's going to do anything. Charles may talk to him, but I think that's as far as it'll go. Now, you should know that they're still not being accepted by the A-list group because Jeff Bezos had an engagement party. All A-listers know Harry and Meghan. But now I'm wondering what's going on because we know Tyler Perry came out. Then it was put out into the news about the call to dad. And then this happened. Well, all calculated because here we go. Uh, there was a Variety Magazine's Power of Women Gala in Los Angeles. And Meghan Markle showed up in this beige, you know, I always had to wear beige at the, in the royal family. But she wore, she, came, she wore beige. Here she is. So now she's in her element. Megan, Megan, look over here. Megan, Megan. And she's turning and twisting, but she's supposed to move down and she won't. So here's what I noticed. First of all, she stood there too long and the woman literally put out her hand and touched Megan on the back and was like, you need to move on. Second of all, she overdid the bronzer again. Remember, she's pushing this I'm Nigerian thing. Now, once the woman pushes her along, she turns around, grabs her hand, laughs, ah, takes two more steps and then stops again. I mean, she won't get off the red carpet. It's a joke. So... She stood there and had her picture taken, and then she went in with a bunch of the other, you know, people that were there for the evening. And one of them was, look at that, from Barbie. Yeah. Now, keep in mind that just because she went doesn't mean anything big happened. But notice the first thing it says is, Duchess of Sussex is thrilled about return to Hollywood. First of all, she didn't return to Hollywood. She was never part of the Hollywood set. She tried to be, but 
Nobody hired her. Second of all, she is milking those titles. Variety put this up, Meghan Markle arrives, and within an hour, it had been changed to Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, okay? So then they go to interview her, unretouched photos, look at the vein, look at the, the cheeks, and look at the fake eyelashes. So she's faking out. Okay, so here's what happened inside. She took a picture with this woman. Perlina, sorry if I'm not saying this right, Igbokwi. She is the chairman of the Universal Studios group, who, by the way, is Nigerian born. Isn't that a coinkadink? And she also took a picture with Janet Yang, who is an American film producer, and she is currently the president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. So she's trying to cozy up to the people that she thinks can help her. And of course, Oprah Winfrey was there. That's probably how she got her foot in the door in the first place. So she gets in there and they go to interview her. And all she talks about is suits from how many years ago? Because that's all she ever had. Now she may be seated in the audience, but notice that those two people are the only ones who released pictures with her. Yeah, because I don't think things really went the way she thought they were gonna go. Now I have to touch on this again, unretouched photos from the Invictus game. Unretouched photo from a few days before she left for the Invictus game. Unretouched photo when she was there for the Navy SEALs, okay? Photoshopped photo of her at this event. Unphotoshopped photo, there you go. That is her real face. And look at the eyebrows, at least she trimmed them. And of course, here we go. Oh, we have so many exciting things. I can't wait till we announce them. Well, she hasn't been able to announce them because she hasn't inked any deals. Sorry, guys, this is just another one of those, believe me, after the Spotify flop and her and Harry being called grifters and the way things have gone at Netflix and the no content, nobody's going to ink them big deals. Nobody. Now, I want to end with this blind item. Do you think when Harry and Meghan do divorce, Harry is going to resent Meghan because he didn't get to see his grandmother before she died because she was throwing that hissy fit about being able to go on the plane? Now, of course, Omid is saying that none of that took place, but here you go. They were invited over and over and over and over again. And they said no over and over and over again. This is totally at her feet. All right, you guys. Oh my God. I so want your comments on this one. And um, don't forget, there is a video on Sunday, okay? Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the like button. If you've already hit the subscribe button, double check, make sure you're still subscribed. If you've donated to my coffee fund, thank you so much. And as always, you guys, have a great day.